we are very happy to um, have to, to be here in intellectual solidarity with everyone in our community. Um, I'm Ann Lounsbury. I'm chair of NYU's Department of Russian Slavic Studies, and I'm a member of the Jordan Center's Faculty Advisory Board. I want to open by underlining our continuing commitment to international scholarly collaboration in the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And in fact, I would say that our commitment to this kind of communication and collaboration has even increased in light of recent horrifying events. Most of you probably saw the open letter from Russian scholars and scientific journalists against the war in Ukraine. It was circulated to 19V by members Alexey, by um, our member Alexey Vdovin, who is um, a member of 19V's own Org Komitet. This is a letter that we fully support, and we'll put a link to it here in the chat. It contains the names of many people we know, many people we don't know, and all of whom we admire for their bravery. This letter now contains nearly 8,000 signatures. Um, meanwhile, under the auspices of 19V, we're working to, to plan a special event to focus on some of these collaborations and contacts and how we're gonna keep them going in the, coming, in the coming months. And we'll let you know how that plan evolves. Okay, I'm very happy to introduce Abby Holkamp of Georgetown University. And she'll be speaking on the topic of Bloody Virgins, Beautiful Avengers, the female Russian nihilists in the European imagination. And our subsidiary is Victoria Freda of Berkeley. Abby, welcome. Thank you, um, Anne. I'm happy to be here today. Um, so we're ready to get started, yes? Um, just want to mention off the top, I have a bit of a sore throat, so apologies if I'm a bit uh, froggy. Um, <clears throat> so as Anne said, I will be speaking about Bloody Virgins and Beautiful Avengers, the female Russian nihilist in the European imagination. Um, if I have time at the end of my talk, I do have a few images um, to show you all, but um, I don't like doing the PowerPoint simultaneously because I get a bit distracted. So um, some of the stuff I mentioned, I will hopefully be able to show you at the end. Okay, so um, today I'm going to speak to you about um, how by the end of the second half of the 19th century, the female so-called nihilist had transformed from an apocryphal Russian revolutionary figure into a durable Russian revolutionary archetype in the European imagination. At the heart of this transformation is a symbiotic relationship between the real and the imagined that was driven by the rapid proliferation of mass media at the time. And for me, this transformation also raises some larger questions about the contours of the role of the cultural imagination and what the West purports to know about Russia. Of course, other scholars have illustrated how cultural imaginaries were and continue to be a key aspect of the West's um, historical relationship with Russia. But today I hope to show you that um, exploring the consolidation of one specific archetype like the female Russian nihilist actually shows really how far into everyday life the tendrils of these cultural imaginaries could reach. So these kinds of fantastic images were not necessarily created by mass media, but they were certainly bolstered by it. And um, I have come to think really that they were as important as more formal transnational diplomatic or political relations as factors in shaping public opinion about Russia and Europe in this period, precisely because they were accessible to a much wider swath of society, as we will see. Um, first, however, I wanna open this talk by considering some of the results of this transformation. So I know this is 19V, you'll have to forgive me for taking a kind of long view of the 19th century and pushing it up to start of World War I uh, in this first part of the talk. So let me tell you about three Russian revolutionaries who were in the news in Europe in the year 1906. Um, two of these revolutionaries um, by our definitions were real and one of them was fake. Um, though I'm going to talk more about the slipperiness of this dichotomy later. So many of you are likely familiar with the first of the three, Maria Spiridonova. In January 1906 in Tambov province, Russia, the SR-affiliated Spiridonova shot and killed provincial official uh, Gavriil Luzhinovsky. Her case became somewhat of an international sensation, not necessarily after her initial act of violence, but when a letter she wrote to her fellow Tambov SRs 
detailing the abuse she had suffered at the hands of Russian officials in prison began to circulate, first in liberal Russian newspapers and then in the press abroad. Spiridonova was not pleased about how she was portrayed in the Russian press, um, especially in a series of articles written by the journalist V.E. of Vladimirov for the paper Rus. One of her fellow Tambov SRs even produced a pamphlet with the goal of correcting public misconceptions about Spiridonova. In it, he called these articles, quote unquote, pulp literature, because they didn't mention at all the socialist beliefs that had motivated Spiridonova. So keep the phrase pulp literature in mind as it will be relevant later. Um, despite the initial outcry, Spiridonova remained in prison until the February revolution. Upon her release, she immediately rejoined the SRs and became a, you know, a national political leader in her own right. She was only free for about two years before she was caught up in the repression of the left SRs by the Bolsheviks with whom they had recently broken. And she was to spend most of the rest of her life in various forms of prison and internal exile until she was ultimately executed in 1941 by the Soviet government she had long ago renounced. Going back to 1906, a little bit later in that year, in August, a Russian woman named Tatiana Lyantyeva shot and killed a French businessman, Charles Mueller, in a hotel in Interlock in Switzerland. She had supposedly mistaken Mueller for Pyotr Dernovo, the former Russian interior minister. When Lyantyeva was arrested by Swiss authorities, she refused to identify herself, setting off a mystery the popular press was eager to unravel. Correspondence for mass circulation Parisian newspapers combed through the Swiss towns she and her husband had visited in the days before the shooting, interviewing people like a dressmaker who had repaired Leontieva's clothes and a merchant who swore he overheard her and her companion speaking Russian outside his shop. Ultimately, the press speculated that Leontieva's overly active imagination was the decisive influence on her actions. According to one Parisian newspaper, it was, quote, Easier to imagine that the unidentified blonde who shot and killed Monsieur Mueller was another bloody nutcase to whom the deeds of Russian revolutionaries, and particularly those of girls who recently haven't hesitated to send a few generals off into the hereafter, have completely taken over their minds. The accused would have acted both by her own initiative as well as out of bravado. She continues to play her role by allowing no one to know who she is." End quote. And even after she was identified by her parents who traveled from Russia to Switzerland to reunite with their daughter, Leontieva's case was analyzed in the press primarily through this kind of a lens. And indeed, um, she did spend the rest of her life in various institutions abroad. Finally, we have the case in October, 1906 of a mysterious 19 year old woman who was arrested in the Southern French city of Toulouse on suspicion of possessing a bomb meant for a Russian governor who had been traveling at the time in the South of France. Like Leontieva, when she was arrested, she at first refused to tell police her real name. She then said that she was a Russian woman named Dolores Sanguinov from Ukraine, who had been studying in Lausanne, Switzerland, when she and her fellow nihilists hatched this supposed plot. Um, Tatiana Leontieva and this new nihilist were brought directly together in a front page editorial in one of the highest circulation Parisian dailies under the headline, Bloody Virgins, Vierge Sanglante. The paper's editor in chief, lamented that after the Interlochen nihilist and the Toulouse nihilist, it's too much, end quote. Acknowledging that these latest nihilists were part of a longer lineage, he wrote that he could not shake the feeling that, quote, despite everything, there's something shocking about the jobs that young women are assigned by terrorist organizations, end quote. For these young women, it was clear that, quote, neither their age nor their sex makes them suitable for the tragic role that is being reserved for them. A wife sharing her husband's dangerous mission is one thing, but tearing girls away from their family, often against their will through intimidation, that's what our Western conscious, conscience refuses to accept. I should note that there's no evidence that this was the case in, with either of these two women. It took about two weeks, but eventually the police and the press who were eager to chronicle the saga of the woman they referred to exclusively as la junialiste russe, the young female Russian nihilist, figured out her real identity. She was not Russian at all. Her name was Jean T, and she was born and raised in the Brittany region of France. Some of what she subsequently reported about her early life in Brittany and in Paris was corroborated by other people, including family members. But large parts of her story remain dubious, especially her supposed dealings with other nihilists. By persisting in this rather intricate charade, T not only frustrated police and court authorities, she was accused of making fools out of them, the press, the broader public. 
Eventually, she was tried on charges of vagrancy, which seems to be the only charge they could come up with um, for her case. On December 12th, 1906, she was acquitted, and what happens to her after her acquittal remains unclear. So beyond the basic facts of their notoriety in various media, their shared time frame, and their shared gender, what connects these three cases? I think considering this case of Janty in concert with those of Maria Spiridonova and Tatiana Lyancheva helps us begin to see what I think are the real consequences of an essentially imaginary construct. So if Spiridonova's exploit has uh, became what one historian called the most famous terrorist act committed by a woman in the era of the first Russian revolution, Leontieva's act has largely been forgotten. Though evidence suggests that of the two events, Leontieva's garnered much more European press coverage at the time. It is the press treatment of Leontieva's case in particular that mirrors several aspects of the coverage of TEs, right? At the heart of both cases was confusion about identity. Um, Leontiev and T both initially refused to identify themselves to police, even as neither protested her innocence. Uh, Leontiev and her husband, who was never identified or tracked down by police, were staying under the name Mr. Henry Strafford at the Hotel Jungfrau, um, where the murder took place. Additionally, Leontiev was, of course, confused about the identity of her victim. While it is not surprising that these confusions added to each case an element of mystery that shaped the press coverage they initially received. Um, both cases, one perhaps more real than the other, tapped into a broader cultural imaginary, um, which I will speak more about in a moment. Um, but why am I saying that the female Russian nihilist is an imaginary construct when it's clear that Russian women were committing acts of political violence that were being covered with great interest in the press? Well, when I first came across um, files from T's case in the French National Archive several years ago, one of the things that initially struck me about it was the fact that European newspapers were still writing about so-called nihilists at all in 1906. A bit of further research showed um, that T was not even the only so-called pseudo nihilist uh, kicking around France in this period. However, her case seemed to fascinate the press far more than others I found who usually just merited a short notice. And of course, I later noticed similar language being used to talk about um, Spiridonova and Leontieva in the French press. And then here's where the slippery nature of that terminology comes in. As other scholars have pointed out, right, the meaning of nihilism has always been ambiguous. And as Victoria herself has uh, pointed out in her own work, Russian writers like Belinsky, Herzen, Turgenev, all dabbled in philosophical themes adjacent to nihilism in their writings in the 1840s and 50s. And Turgenev, of course, is generally credited with introducing the nihilist to the wider reading public in his 1862 novel, Fathers and Sons. Nihilism's most precise expression is usually attributed to the writings of the critic Dmitry Pisaryov, who famously identified him with Turgenev's nihilist Bazarov. From the 1880s onward, it is very true that terms like nihilist, anarchist, in addition to terrorist, revolutionary, radical, and extremist, were sometimes used interchangeably and frequently used inconsistently in press and police reports in France and based on some preliminary research in other places as well. Um, and the same was true in some of the popular fiction and other popular media featuring radical female characters that were circulating at the time, about which I'll say more later. Um, this was also something uh, revolutionary emigres in Europe's Russian colonies had noticed and debated in the decades prior, um, which I will also say more about in a moment. For now, I'll just say that even with the blurring of terminology, which deserves some more thought, looking at the way T's narrative was represented, and again, before she was identified, she was exclusively referred to as a nihilist, made me wonder whether there was something about the idea of this young female Russian nihilist that was particularly titillating for the producers and consumers of the rapidly expanding print culture of fin de siècle France or of Europe more broadly. On this note, another aspect of the tea episode that particularly interested me when I first came across her case was the raw, albeit fleeting of course, credibility of her invented biography. So I'm gonna lay that out in a bit more detail now. In her initial account, T's parents were reported to have moved with her to Yekaterinoslav, modern day Dnipro, from St. Petersburg, where they had what one paper called a quote, rather glitzy setup. Um, 
somewhat unusually for a woman at, at the time. She had, she said she had received a classical education studying Greek, Latin, and the sciences. As a result, she spoke several languages, not only her own Slavic tongue, but also Czech, German, and a bit of French. Um, she undertook university studies in St. Petersburg and Lausanne. Um, her hands had been injured in St. Petersburg during um, the failed 1905 revolution, which was referred to somewhat dismissively by one newspaper as an échauffeuré, like a scuffle or a brawl. After healing, um, she had to keep her hands in a special apparatus for two months. She traveled once again to Lausanne, where in the company of her fellow nihilists, this current ostensible plot began to take shape. The name Dolores Sanguina, which you can note the obvious lexical connection to the word sanguine with its bloody connotation, came to police from a railway station buffet proprietor who remembered talking to her at his buffet. A few days later, two medical students who had treated her in a Paris hospital identified her as Dolores Sanguinati or Sanguinetti, spelled both ways. And when confronted in court by these two medical students as witnesses, T was reported to have blushed and wept, asking, why are you doing this? To which the judge replied, because we have to know who you are and why you've been leading us on for a week. The journalist agreed to explain, but insisted that no journalist be present during her conversation with the judge. She said she was afraid of newspapers and what they would say about her. So this gets me to my key question about this case. How was a 19 year old provincial French woman um, we find out later she's the daughter of a baker and a vegetable seller, and she has an average amount of formal education. How was she able to create a character whose life story pretty accurately mimicked those of actual Russian women who ran in revolutionary circles in the second half of the 19th century? In the absence of evidence, we can't definitively answer the question of why a provincial French youth invented this very plausible backstory for what one lawyer called her imaginary crime. However, by asking how she was able to do so, we do find ample evidence that female Russian nihilists were, in fact, an object of particular fascination, not only in the imagination of fin de siècle France, but also throughout Western Europe. So I have several preliminary answers to this question of how, some of which I've already begun, begun to touch on, um, such as the ambiguous meanings of nihilism and nihilist, and the conspicuously gendered representations of political violence, ubiquitous in popular media. Um, in addition, I think important pieces of the answer to the how question include the established existence of a cultural imaginary of terrorism and how that cultural imaginary interacted with a sense of theatricality in behavior and self-presentation, and also the deliberate entanglement of fact and fiction in popular media coupled with the proliferation of mass media at the end of the 19th century. So in the second part of this talk, I'll speak about all of these themes in more detail, um, circling back to the case of Jean T as needed. So I've come to see her short-lived case as a foundational example of what one scholar has called the cultural imaginary of terrorism. So the scholar, Michael Frank, argues that from the late 19th century through to the post 9-11 world, Fact and fiction have been inextricably entangled in public discourse about terrorism. This cultural imaginary is not, is not wholly created by fictional representations of terrorism in novels and you know, in our present day movies and so forth, but it is instead generated when, quote, these fictions exploit a propensity for fantasy already present in both terrorist activities and the discourse surrounding them. And in exploring the manifestations of this cultural imaginary through the lens of T's exploit, I think Yuri Lotman's work on the semiotics of behavior is also relevant. So right, Lotman describes the conscious theatricality of the behavior of early 19th century Russian nobles and attributed, attributed it to their interactions with romantic and sentimental texts. Other scholars of course then picked up that analysis of the Decemberists in particular and applied the approach to later Russian radicals um, of the 1860s to 1880s who were inspired by reading the realist works of Chernyshevsky and his contemporaries. I think this approach can be further usefully applied to a subsequent transnational popularization of radical archetypes such as the female Russian nihilist. And again, this popularization is made possible by the rapid development of mass media in this time. Um, to me, the very term nihilist 
was essentially a fictional construct in this much later historical context, right? As we know, the original nihilists of the mid 19th century, as ambiguous as they may have been, were analyzed through and then transformed by fictional texts. By 1906, the way in which T's actions made an increasingly imaginary construct real exemplified how mass media could shape and sustain a feedback loop between the real and the imaginary. So of course, as I've already mentioned, there were female terrorists, um, especially in the Russian context. And an increase in terrorism of many different types was a genuine concern at the turn of the 20th century in Europe. But the signifiers of female Russian nihilist were imaginary in the way Frank uses the term. Um, per Lotman, T's behavior, which I think was theatrical in its own way, must have been inspired by the media she consumed. So on the one hand, the nihilist was not real. She was instead a representation that was propagated and promoted in particular ways within a rapidly changing information ecosystem. On the other hand, she was very real as an archetype through which fin de siècle Europeans formulated knowledge about Russia and the East. If the nihilist was imaginary, it did not matter. And this was in part because there was a blurred boundary between fact and fiction built into the contemporary media landscape. So I'll talk more, a bit more about this blurry boundary now. One of the more stark examples of it, I think we find in the French mass circulation newspaper itself, where two genres exemplified what scholars like Vanessa Schwartz have identified as an unprecedented flood of textual representation in the late 19th century. So first we have the roman feuilleton, um, a piece of popular fiction serialized in a newspaper. And second, there's the fait divers, which there's not a great English equivalent, but translates as something like sundry events or fillers, which were short news items that were also designed to have mass appeal, often relating to crime. On the most rudimentary level, a fait divers was fact and a roman feuilleton was fiction. But in practice, this distinction was not always so clear. In fact, as one scholar has put it, we can see them as inextricably linked. The success of the quote unquote imaginary worlds of the roman feuilleton was due to the fait divers and its often novelistic depiction of real world events. Um, another scholar using a sample of 500 fait divers items published from 1836 to 1881, um, she found that 40% explicitly reproduced um, with some sort of citation, a fait divers from another source, uh, whether Parisian, provincial, or even a foreign paper. Even at the end of the 19th century, Many reports explicitly labeled as coming from a foreign correspondent were merely translated news items from foreign papers. Um, only a handful really of the largest Parisian dailies had the budget to maintain reporters in other European capitals. Uh, though this looks a bit different in other countries, particularly England where um, newspapers often had more money for foreign correspondents. And the stories about Jean T contain evidence of these kinds of rewriting practices. Um, I also mentioned them because I think the pervasive nature of these practices does make it possible to speak about a European imagination in the context of journalistic representations. So as I said, um, gender, of course, played a conspicuous role um, in the relationship of the changing media landscape to public discourse. And we can see the roots of this going back into the actual 19th century in the sensational representations of actual Russian women who committed acts of political violence during kind of the first wave of terrorism in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, the 1878 trial of Vera Zasulich for her attempted assassination of Fyodor Trepov was probably the first influential imagining of a female Russian terrorist by a mass audience, both inside and outside of Russia. As Anna Siljak explains in her study of the case, Zasulich was clear in her later writings that she had wanted to be a martyr for her act. But with her acquittal, she instead became a celebrity. Her celebrity was cemented in Europe by writers like fellow revolutionary Sergei Stepniak Krepchinsky, known as Stepniak, who fled Russia a few months after Zasulich's trial, um, shortly after he had stabbed the chief of gendarme in St. Petersburg. Um, Stepniak never claimed his own act of terrorism really outright, 
but he made his name in Europe writing about other Russian revolutionaries, um, many of whom like Zasulich, he knew and with whom he continued to associate in exile. His first book, Underground Russia um, from 1883, was a collection of various sketches of um, revolution revolutionaries, including, excuse me, Zasulich and Sofia Perovskaya, um, right, the only woman among the group convicted for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II. Stepniak underscored the outsized role imagination played in creating the archetype of the female Russian revolutionary, um, writing of Zasulich that, quote, in the absence of correct information, imagination entered the field, and everyone painted her according to his fancy, end quote. Nevertheless, for Stepniak, she was, quote, a universal and undisputed celebrity, and, quote, a woman for whom great decisions a woman for great decisions and for great occasions of quote, noble and prolific idealism. I mentioned Stefaniak in part because he was cannier than most of his contemporaries about how to make use of the place the nihilist already occupied in the European imagination. Um, he criticized inaccurate use of the term nihilist, but nonetheless continued to use it in recognition of the meanings it had already taken on outside of Russia and perhaps the titillation it caused. As Underground Russia was going to press as a book, Stepniak wrote a letter to the executive committee of the people's will in Russia, in which he outlined his thinking on why such a book should be published. Quote, Europe has its own affairs, its own troubles. And up to now it has been interested in nihilists more as a rare and wondrous beast, more as an amusement, as a kind of curious gladiatorial combat it does not recognize in them any particle of itself, and we have to hammer and keep hammering away at one point so that we can hammer it into their skull that our contemporary ter terrorists are the men of 93 and 89 in France to whom all of Europe gives pride of place." End quote. A review of contemporary reports um, in the press confirms the broad cultural impact of Stepniak's book in Europe. Um, it was published in several languages nearly simultaneously. And reviewers often evalu evaluated it specifically in relation to fictional works. One British reviewer noted that though Stepniak seemed, quote, very indignant at the fancy sketches of Russian revolutionaries that appeared in novels, quote, the story which he himself, which he has himself to tell is little inferior in romantic interests to the most romantic conceptions of the novelists who have chosen to put forward their fond imaginings of what Russian socialism is like, end quote. Another reviewer who critiqued the quote, mere nonsense previously produced by novelists and playwrights nevertheless enthusiastically recommended Stepniak's book to others, quote, whether as history or as romance. Stepniak died in a train accident in 1895. Um, sometime after his death, Vera Zasulich mused that what Stepniak had considered the quote unquote obligatory work of writing about so-called nihilism for a European audience had quote, prevented him from concentrating on the literary activity that gave him pleasure and where probably he could have achieved quite a lot. So Stepniak reluctantly embraced the term nihilism because he felt that if he could build on received representations of revolutionary Russia, which came in large part from novels, he could show Europeans that a nihilist was not a rare and wondrous beast, but rather consonant with the revolutionary traditions of which Europeans were proud and therefore deserving of the public's support. This approach contrasted sharply with that of another um, revolutionary turned publicist in exile, uh, Lev Tikhomirov. Tikhomirov was a former member of the Executive Committee of the People's Will and published an influential book in France, La Russie Politique et Sociale in 1886, which contained an entire appendix on the quote unquote nihilist problem. Unlike Stepniak, he refused to use the term in his work and explained that the concept of nihilism was a chimera. Quote, to be sure the intellectual movement in Russia as elsewhere can give rise in certain individual cases to some ridiculous, silly manifestations, lending themselves to caricature, some possibly even criminal. It is precisely from these particular cases that nihilism was composed, uniting them without any reason whatsoever into one single idea, despite the fact that they were in no way united in reality. Thus in nature, there are creatures who have tails, others with lizard scales, still others with a tiger's paw and claws, others still with wings, 
When you bring all of these attributes together in a dragon, you have before you a creature or a creation of your imagination, not a real being. This is exactly how nihilism was created. But if the dragon plays a convenient role in tales used to frighten children, it has no place in natural history. In a serious study of Russia, nihilism as a doctrine or a particular trend similarly can have no place. So the question remained as to whether the fiction of Tikhomirov's dragon or Stepniak's rare and wondrous beast could be used to create real understanding. So in addition to showing up in the press, so-called nihilists were also represented in a variety of other popular media. Um, I'm gonna speak a bit more in depth about fiction shortly, but I'll mention a couple of other genres first. Um, for example, in, in 1882, a new wax museum, the Musée Crevin, opened in central Paris. The scale and intricacy of, it, of its exhibits was unprecedented. Um, it was more than a collection of individual wax figures, as was the norm in other museums. Uh, rather, it displayed full-scale dioramas inspired by history, literature, current events. At its opening, one such diorama depicted an imagined scene of nihilists being violently arrested by Russian police in an apartment full of real items imported from Russia, such as a samovar and various books and papers. So I think this early diorama epitomizes kind of a combined desire for sensationalism and also for verisimilitude that drove popular portrayals of nihilists. Um, a few years later, the museum would really outdo itself on this level of realism by spending thousands of francs to acquire the actual bathtub in which Jean-Paul Marat had been stabbed in, 19, in 1793 um, for its new diorama depicting his murder by Charlotte Corday. I mention this now both because I just really love that fact and because Charlotte Corday will become a ubiquitous point of comparison for the female Russian nihilist in European media. Um, moving on, given the theatrical aspects of this, of this nihilistic behavior, it's also not surprising to see representations um, bleed over into the literary landscape of the theater as well. So one year after the opening of the Musée Gravin, for example, um, we see the image of the female nihilist um, in the European imagination kind of being consolidated on stage by, of all people, Oscar Wilde. Um, his very first play, Vera or the Nihilists. Um, for Wilde, the Nihilist was first and foremost a literary invention, a quote, strange martyr who has no faith, who goes to the stake without enthusiasm and dies for what he does not believe in, a, pure, a purely literary product. He was invented by Turgenev and completed by Dostoevsky, end quote. Although in his contemporary correspondence, Wilde acknowledged the very real European revolutionary movements that were currently, quote, threatening thrones and making governments unstable from Spain to Russia, end quote. The most compelling feature of the nihilist's imagined milieu for him was instead its sort of timeless romantic quality. His Vera was, um, he wrote to an actress friend, quote, a play not of politics, but of passion. And the nihilist was still on stage by the first decade of the 20th century, appearing in other popular genres as an object of humor or horror or a mix of both. For example, in June 1910, the Théâtre du Grand Guignol in Paris, which had been infamous um, since 1897 for its terrifying over-the-top horror shows, began its summer season with The Attack, a play about a Russian nihilist plot. According to one critic, the play was, quote, the quintessential Grand Guignol play, the type of nice little nihilist drama whose effect on the audience is always a sure thing, end quote. So the Grand Guignol's aesthetic was naturalism just ratcheted up to fantastic and macabre heights. And I think one can draw a line from the conventions of the often absurd fait divers um, to the way the subject of the nihilist was apparently treated by the Grand Guignol and its audience. Um, however, I think it's also interesting to note that reactions to these bloody and body works, um, which right, featured highly exaggerated characters, were often still concerned with questions of authenticity. And critics did interrogate these deliberately titillating works as sources of information about Russia. So as we've seen, um, this kind of breathless writing about Russian women who committed acts of political violence continued through the second prominent wave of Russian terrorism that began around 1905. Both Spiridonova and Leontieva 
were made more legible at the time by drawing connections to the French revolutionary tradition I mentioned earlier. Um, during her March 1906 trial, one of Spiridonova's lawyers used the historical parallel to argue that his client's violent actions against a tyrant were far from aberrant. Every Marat must find his Charlotte Corday, he concluded, quote, and perhaps that is the great law of human conscience. So this inv invocation both of the universal, right, which recalls the, a typical framing of 1789 itself as universal, and the specific, right, Charlotte Corday, who killed Marat in 1793, is kind of typical from what I've seen. So we, blurring the lines between fact and fiction, past and present, the real and the romantic, made these the actions of these Russian women perhaps more understandable, especially, but not exclusively, to a Western European audience. Oscar Wilde's Vera had melodramatically proclaimed, quote, Methinks the spirit of Charlotte Corday has entered my soul now. I shall carve my name on the world and be ranked among the great heroines. I, the spirit of Charlotte Corday, beats in each petty vein and nerves my woman's hand to strike as I have nerved my woman's heart to hate. A brief aside, as you might be able to tell from that dialogue, uh, Wilde's Vera is generally considered to not have been a very good play. Um, so in 1906, the Journal de Genève actually ran a dramatization of Spiridonova's story as a feuilleton. Um, so a literal iteration of the pulp literature she asked her SR colleague to inveigh against in his pamphlet. And in this feuilleton, she is described as, quote, a heroine, a sister of Charlotte Corday. Meanwhile, a newspaper correspondent in London wrote that Leontieva was, quote, a typical red virgin of the 20th century. Her fashionable attire concealed a character as grim as any of the red-capped virgins of the terror. Instead of a pike or musket in her hands, she carried explosives in her work basket and bombs in her trunk, and their mission was just as deadly. The modern day female anarchist is an enthusiast, a fanatic, and a mystic, as well as a criminal. So the aesthetic of the female Russian nihilist, um, was a key part of these gendered framings, right? It's as important a signifier as the way she supposedly behaved. In Russia, as I'm sure many of you know, stereotypes about what a female nihilist looked like coalesced during the 1860s. Short hair, unadorned and somber, if not unkempt um, attire, certain accessories such as peasant style walking sticks, wide brimmed hats with rounded crowns, eyeglasses with a dark blue tint, um, all choices that as scholars have pointed out, made both the class and the gender of the wearer less immediately recognizable. Um, while it was advantageous for those actually engaged in revolutionary activity to continue to dress according to the norms of their social status so as to avoid detection, from their first appearance in the 1860s, in the words of one historian, it was often difficult to tell the nihilist from the poseur because of course people decided to try out the clothes and the behavior of nihilism without adopting its ideas. As the first French reviewer of Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done put it um, when the translation came out in 1876, quote, no one is unaware of the progress that nihilism has made in recent years. The cropped hair, the round hat, and the blue tinted glasses of nihilist women have completed their world tour. So it might seem obvious to point out that one could not necessarily identify a nihilist by how she looked. Yet those supposed signifiers would remain a shorthand for decades albeit one that did not necessarily provide immediate clarity. Um, incongruous descriptions of these women were common in the press, um, to give a couple examples. In just one article um, in a French paper, we see the quote unquote beautiful Maria Spiridonova's appearance um, kind of described as both non-threatening, saying she's an adorably beautiful young lady, uh, une jeune femme adorablement belle, and also threatening. Um, she's a beautiful avenger, la belle vengeresse. Again, within the pages of one newspaper, um, Le Petit Parisien again, Tatiana Leontova was variously described as elegant with fine manners or as simple and unsophisticated. There was debate over how nice her clothes actually were, which the newspaper's unnamed special correspondent resolved by tracking down a local dressmaker Leontova had visited to inquire about a sewing repair and quizzing this dressmaker on the contents of Leontova's trunk. 
Um, right, well, there are certainly practical reasons for distributing the photo of someone whose identity is being sought. The making of Leontieva's portrait was also kind of a large part of her narrative in the press. When Leontieva was photographed by police, the reporter noted that she was seen, quote, once in dark blue with a mantle trimmed with faux astrakhan, once in white with a lace bolero and a straw hat, and once in a writing habit with a bowler hat believed to belong to her alleged husband, end quote, you know, as if reporting on a fashion shoot. And all of these images subsequently appeared in different issues of the paper. So moving on, I wanna talk a little bit more specifically about novels. Um, although the heyday of novels and roman feuilleton starring female nihilists had kind of passed by the 1890s, we do see similar preoccupations persisting in the production and consumption of fiction. Um, first of all, within their pages, um, these novels were almost never presented as wholly fictional. To give two brief examples, first, um, in a preface to his novel, Alexander the Nihilist, Louis Noir, who was a prolific and a best-selling author of adventure stories, declared that the story of Alexandra, which contained some characters based on real people and some that were wholly fictional, um, is both une histoire vraie, a true story, and un drame d'amour, a romantic drama. However, interestingly, the text appears to have been recycled. The same tale was published by Noir in 1865 under the title Martyrs of Poland, right? Having been a couple published a couple of years after um, 1863 in Poland. Um, another example of the blending of fact with fiction is Marie-Louise Gagnier's 1880 novel Les Vierges Russes, The Russian Virgins, which also contained real people. Um, Dar Alexander II is a prominent character. Uh, we see Fyodor Trepov and Vera Zasulich, to name a few, and included extensive factual information and observations about the current political situation in Russia. These novels were also explicitly treated in the press as sources of knowledge about nihilists. Um, for example, we see um, an 1880 review of the English translation of Ernest Lavigne's French novel, The Story of a Nihilist used as much space to interrogate the novel as a source of information, and also the sources of information used to write the novel, as it did to recount its plot or discuss its literary merits. The reviewer emphasized that certain elements of the plot in which a nihilist named Pavlovna worked to convert to the cause the woman whose governess she used to be, so that the nihilist could use her inheritance to fund their activities, are quote, outrageous and incredible. The reviewer also asserted, however, that the novel was an accurate representation of nihilist ideas and the nihilist milieu, quote, all too near the truth. And we see a similar attitude um, toward these novels in this brief notice printed in Le Radical in July, 1890, quote, the fourth edition of the Vierge Russe by M.L. Gagnier appears tomorrow from Dantu. This book written from authentic documents provided by Prince Kropotkin, Vera Zasulich and Adelaide um, Lukanin makes the most curious revelations about the mysterious role of nihilist women, many of whom belong to the nobility and condemn themselves by proselytizing in the humblest conditions. The trial of yesterday gives this truthful novel a new and lively relevance, end quote. So I wanna end by talking a little bit more in depth about how that novel, um, The Russian Virgins, which was originally published in 1880 and was clearly popular enough to go through several reprints in the next decade, um, there's also an English translation of it from 1881 that has the title A Nihilist Princess. Interestingly, The Russian Virgins is one of the few examples of this kind of novel that I could find about a female nihilist that was written by a woman author. Um, Marie-Louise Gagnier was a feminist activist in addition to being a writer, and she actually got her start by penning Roman Feuilleton for newspapers like those I described earlier. So let me give you a quick synopsis. The novel's protagonist is 20-year-old Wanda Krylov, a Russian princess and a fervent socialist. She's admitted to a revolutionary cell in St. Petersburg as its sole female member. And in order to maintain trust, she must take vows of both secrecy and celibacy. Her assignment is to watch and report on the activities of her aristocratic peers, and also to convert others, primarily women factory workers, to the cause. Wanda brings her extraordinary beauty, intelligence, social position, and wealth to this underground campaign um, to liberate the Russian people. As the object of the ardent desire of a number of suitors, 
which really run the gamut, including her noble cousin, um, a highly placed member of the secret police, and a Frenchman who lost his fortune to love and is now in Russia pursuing a railway project um, under the protection of Wanda and her father, um, Wanda frequently finds herself under pressure from the men around her. Although no one from her aristocratic circle really accepts the idea that she could actually be a nihilist, as months pass, Wanda finds she cannot sustain her double life and finally publicly declares herself to be a socialist and a revolutionary. She's eventually arrested and imprisoned and despite a last minute reprieve obtained from the czar himself um, is executed by firing squad. So like the novel by Louis Noir that I mentioned a moment ago, Gagnard's novel also contains this mix of imagined and historical characters. It opens with a preface that promises to answer readers questions about nihilists because the novel is quote, as exact a depiction as possible of a movement that later on will have its place in the philosophical and social history of the 19th century, end quote. So Gagnier, like Stepniak, Tikhomirov, others, um, also had something to say about the issue of terminology. Certain male characters in particular have a lot of trouble believing that Wanda is a nihilist. At the very beginning of the novel, one character says that though some people may call Wanda a nihilist, um, he clarifies to, to his friend that they must mean that she's, quote, an amateur nihilist, and in the more acceptable sense of the term, because I wouldn't want to do her the disservice of confusing her with that bunch of lowlifes, cowards, and drunks who call themselves nihilists, revolutionaries, and anarchists, end quote. In the words of one of uh, Wanda's suitors, quote, socialist, you, the personification of elegance, beauty, and distinction? Socialists must all be poured into the same mold, ugly, vulgar, and nasty, end quote. Rather, he, he labels Wanda as eccentric. Um, later on, he tells her, quote, you are indeed beautiful, but it's a terrible beauty, uh, um, beauté terrible. If I loved you less, you would scare me, end quote. Um, Gagnier seems to in interject with her own views on terminology at certain points in the novel, writing um, in asides at different points that, quote, there exist in Russia no nihilists, strictly speaking, they are political philosophers, free thinkers, or humanitarians who are pursuing a broad ideal, end quote. Or um, later on, she writes that, quote, nihilist is only a word. Russian revolutionaries follow 20 different flags. Today, what ties them all together is the very absence of a well-defined program that would be recognized and accepted by all, end quote. Um, she follows that with a quite specific list of different groups and their influences and depictions um, touching on Fourier, Bakunin, Chernyshevsky, Turgenev, Comte, Marx, Proudhon. So despite her fairly um, factual grasp of Russian revolutionary movements, which is something often missing from other nihilist novels, which is what I've been calling them, uh, Gagnier ultimately employs all the same tropes when it comes to the character of Wanda. So we could attribute this to the limitations or conventions of her genre, but regardless of why Gagnier wrote uh, Wanda as she did, her characterization continued the process of creating a revolutionary archetype um, in the French and European imaginations. So in this sense, um, the novel I think actually represents a kind of compendium of the themes and images um, related to the female nihilists that were circ circulating widely and vividly in this period. And I've got a list of them, but uh, I'll skip over that for now. So um, I can talk about that more in questions. So let me just end now. Um, offering a couple concluding thoughts. Um, so in analyzing this fundamental example of the cultural imaginary of terrorism, um, I have suggested how a nebulous relationship between fact and fiction, um, further blurred by the proliferation of mass media in the second half of the 19th century, helped make what had become an apocryphal Russian figure into a durable Russian archetype. And this occurred not only because terrorists were tantalizing fodder for media spectacle, but also because terrorists and radicals needed and cultivated the media for publicity. I think it is also apparent that representations of the essentially by this point fictional archetype of the female Russian nihilist had an impact not only on public opinion, but also on public behavior, right? A case like Jean Tease shows that the idea of a generative relationship between literature and radical behavior has potentially broader transnational implications beyond its application by Lotman and others to um, specific Russian social milieu. Um, while scholars in various disciplines have shown that gendered ways of framing political violence persist in the present day, um, I also think it is telling 
this is something I'm currently thinking more about now, how stable these gender discourses about terrorism seem to have remained since the fin de siècle. Uh, for example, in the 1970s, the female Russian nihilist was invoked by commentators in Europe as they struggled to explain why women in groups such as the Italian Red Brigades and the West German Red Army faction would commit political violence. Um, but as far as I can tell, kind of the contours of this comparison haven't um, been analyzed in depth in this growing body of work on media representations of female terrorists in 20th century Europe. So I'll conclude here by saying that I think that any explanation for the continuity in certain gender ways of representing female political violence needs to take into account how deeply embedded in the European imagination archetypes like the female nihilist already were by the turn of the 20th century. Thank you. Abby, thank you for that absolutely fascinating talk. Um, Victoria Freda is our subsidnik. Victoria. Hi, thank you, Abby, for giving us this uh, fascinating paper. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to comment. Um, I've been told to speak only for five minutes and to tie this to broader themes in the, in the 19th century and show why it might be timely. So as for timely, in the past three weeks, we've seen how news media have struggled to pull together what little they know about Russia and Ukraine. And this was especially noteworthy uh, in the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, how little journal journalists actually know about Russia and Ukraine right now. And early on, we saw them tr trying to piece together what little they knew, uh, drawing not only on, on facts, but also on cultural stereotypes about Russia and Ukraine. So it seems to be a common theme that at times of political crisis, people reach for whatever comes to hand, uh, whatever, uh, whatever images they have may have of the country to make sense of contemporary events. Looking back at the turn of the 20th century, you can also imagine how Western journalists struggled to explain contemporary events. Shortly before 1906, the year that Abby is concentrating on, there they had had to account for the Russo-Japanese War the revolution of 1905, in addition to the ongoing cycle of violence connected to the revolutionary movement and revolutionary terrorism. As Abby shows, women terrorists loomed large in French and British uh, cultural imaginary, in the French and British cultural imaginary in this time. In the year 1906, three women in particular, as she shows, captured their attention, Maria Spiridonova, Tatiana Leontseva, and Jeanne Tilly. Journalists, novelists, and playwrights reached for the term nihilism to, to characterize them. So the question is, why do they reach for this term in particular? Holkamp takes us back to the literature, especially the fiction of the early 1880s to understand how nihilism entered this picture. And again, we might think of that time period, 1879 to 1883, um, when, if you do a Google engram, nihilism spikes in, uh, in, European, uh, in European literature. Um, that's the time when Western journalists had to account for Vera Sasulich's attempted assassination of Fyodor Trepov, and then 1881 with the ass assassination of Alexander II himself. So again, journalists reaching for something to make sense of seemingly inexplicable uh, developments. Here too, um, the label, so here the label with nihilism was slapped onto Russian revolutionaries and it stuck. So one might think that in 1906, it simply came to hand again because it had already been circulating for 30 years. But we might take an even broader view of the turn of the century and at nihilism to ask ourselves why this fascination with Russia's women terrorists. Moral malaise of the fin de siècle, which Mark Steinberg talks about in his book, which we are all familiar with, um, may have been a feature here. So we think of the, the turn of the century and, uh, and, and modernism as saturated with this fear of moral degeneration, the sense that the world has come sort of, this kind of, sort of coming apart, that um, modern subjects have la lost a moral compass. And we might think of women as figuring largely in this concern precisely because women are so strongly associated with as, as bearers of, of a cultural morality. And so when women start behaving um, in, in violent and unprecedented ways, this is particularly concerning for people who are otherwise concerned about a moral degeneration. 
nihilism, the term that was introduced by Turgenev, of course, circulated abroad because of the popularity of Turgenev's novels. Um, but we might also think about Nietzsche as another writer who was uh, fashionable around the turn of the century. In the French context, it's worth bearing in mind that his um, will to power was first translated in 1903 and was widely reviewed in the French press. Um, and I have just a quote from one of these reviews of Nietzsche's, uh, of, of, uh, Nietzsche's will to power, which kind of resonated for me with what you have to say about the tenor of the commentary on these women. So the reviewer wrote, and this is in Revue de Paris, um, his nihilism is practical and destructive. He would have liked to destroy himself, to annihilate this desolate world, even as he knew that this rage for destruction is itself impotent and sterile. So we see the turn of the, of the 20th century as a moment of sort of, of a kind of a moral, a sense of moral decline. Feuilletons, um, feuilletons incidentally are themselves seen as highly problematic precisely because of their blending of fact and fiction, a possible source of in increasing moral confusion and factual confusion. Um, but what's also fascinating about Abby's paper is that indeed this um, blending of high and low culture. And Abby's of course, most particularly interested in the popular culture aspect of this. But one thing I find fascinating about the, about the entire topic is exactly how this cult, the cult, two cultural levels or all cultural levels seem to infuse each other. Um, and then just to go to back where I started from, um, obviously, once again, writers reach for everything that comes to hand, you know, to the books that are sitting on their, on their desk or on their, on their table, tabletop, to their bookshelf, and then to the newspapers that they find on sale in the local tobacco store. So, um, and at moments of crisis, they, yeah, they reach for everything. All right, thank you. Victoria, thank you very much. Um, I, I know that there will be questions about this fascinating paper. So, well, I guess first, Abby, we'll, um, I'll, I'll ask if you'd like to respond to anything Victoria said, and then after that, we can open up the floor to questions. Um, yeah, just very briefly, um, thank you for that. Uh, the broader context of um, fin de siècle malaise is I guess something that was in the back of my mind, but I hadn't really started to put the pieces together yet. And I think that's definitely something I wanna think more about. And the, thank you for the Nietzsche mention as well. Um, would it be okay if I briefly went through a couple of images um, to kind of support what I was talking about? Okay. Um, Cause I think these might also spark some questions. So just a few things. Um, so here's Gentil on the front page of Le Petit Parisien. Um, uh, as La Russe Mysterieuse. Um, here are some of the other <laughs> mentions of pseudo nihilists. Uh, these are from the Matin. Um, here is a picture of the diorama I mentioned at the Musée Cravin, um, which is just fascinating. I love how expressive the figures are. Um, actually, what else do I have? Okay, here's Tatiana Lyantseva in a couple of her different outfits um, on the front page of Petit Parisien. Um, and this was before um, her identity was discovered. Um, here is the front cover of an edition of Louis Noir's Alexandra the Nihilist, in which we see quite a lot of <laughs> Russian tropes going on. Um, I love the bear who's sort of uh, menacing Alexandra in the corner. Um, here's an image that actually accompanied that quote I read um, about Tatiana Lyantova being a red virgin. And I shared it because I think it is interesting. I'm sure a lot of us have seen those kind of postcards and other objects that show sort of the revolutionary pantheon. We see that kind of visual trope reproduced here. And we see it in kind of the visual language of later, uh, not, you know, not to, <laughs> thank you for indulging me for bringing us into the 20th century. Um, but I think the repetition of some of these kind of pantheon type tropes is another interesting thing I've been thinking about. So um, that's all. Thank you for letting me share those. And I'm eager um, to hear more questions. 
Thank you, Abby. And those images are amazing. And I was actually thinking of Patty Hearst too. Um, Definitely. When you, were, when you were showing some of these, it's absolutely incredible, the, the sort of thread that you're able to trace. So yeah, I'm hoping the eventual book project will be able to really take it from the 19th century into that, that era. Yeah. Thank you. I'll open up the floor and Sasha um, will be watching the chat. Thank you very much for the topic you brought today because I'm I'm dealing myself with nihilism um, well of the middle of the 19th century. What I was asking and what the, the topic I'm struggling about with uh, nihilism by myself is uh, this link, like the nihilism as a term uh, borrowed from the fiction literature, which somehow appropriated all. Um, so we, when we are talking about men, we, we call them and newspapers call them social revolutionaries. When we're talking about uh, women and when we read about women, we actually read about, usually we read about uh, nihilists. Though like, and the, the nihilism as a term somehow deprives women from the political action because Spiridonova herself, she was a part of the uh, social revolutionary party and she had something to say and she had something to do. Although when a newspaper labeled her as nihilist, it somehow deprived her from a uh, political, like it, it um, took away her political agency in some way. And I found this, 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 this fact very problematic because uh, uh, this kind of labeling women as nihilists is um yeah refers us to talk about their appearance about their haircuts and uh, doesn't let us to to find out more about what they thought and somehow blur what they did and uh it's just uh, a general remark but i i i also wanted to ask you if you you felt um this, um, if you met this problem in in in, in French uh, newspapers of the of the period. Thank you. Um, thank you. Should I respond as we? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Masha. Um, I have definitely had similar thoughts um, in my head. One thing I'd like to do as I continue to do more work is pay more attention to the sort of masculinities of it all. Um, and as you can see, even from a couple of the images I showed, at least in the French case, you do see men being referred to as nihilists, right? That diorama that I showed, that was all men. I don't think there were any women in it. Both of those pretend nihilists um, were men. Um, but I do think you're right that there is something tricky about how it's gendered um, and how it sort of takes away political agency. Um, I'm not sure I have much of a good answer to that other than that I totally agree with you in terms of that being like a, a kind of thing that's difficult um, to put a finger on. Obviously, I think, especially, you know, there's some connection to be made between um, nihilism and sort of romanticism and other kinds of um, things like that. But yeah, I, I definitely um, definitely agree with you on that. And maybe that's something we can talk about further once I have maybe an answer, or hopefully you get an answer eventually. <laughs> and we have a question in the chat from Natalie Cornett. Uh, were male nihilists in the early 20th century also romanticized and in what way? Or was this reserved for female nihilist revolutionaries? Also, did you find examples in perhaps leftist or socialist presses in Western Europe of journalists taking the actions of female revolutionaries seriously, or at least acknowledging their political views and actions rather than reflections on their beauty or the forced nature of their involvement in wider movements? Um, yeah, that's a really great question and obviously kind of 
connects to um, Masha's question. So um, I think by the early 20th century, this kind of romanticization seems to me to be more reserved for female nihilists. It may be a bit different, um, you know, when we get back into the kind of 1860s to 1880s period. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that to me, it's not necessarily an either or, um, you know, obviously in some of the cases that I pointed to, um, the press or whomever really wasn't acknowledging the kind of political agency of these women or, you know, the seriousness of their actions. But a lot of times you see both, right? Um, for example, Stepniak's book, I, I, you know, kind of quoted selectively from it because I was interested in how he writes about imagination. But, you know, he takes Vera Zasulic and Sofia Porovskaya as, as seriously as he takes anyone and certainly doesn't, you know, attribute their actions to being, you know, overly emotional or something like that. That kind of language is mixed in with um, also taking it seriously, if that makes sense. Um, I think probably you would see something different in kind of more explicitly leftist or socialist um, presses, but I think you would also see a mix of language just because of how, you know, um, how things were at the time for women, right? You can take something seriously and take a woman's political agency seriously and still describe her as beautiful or alluring or something like that, right? So I think it's a really interesting tension that definitely I would like to think about more. But yeah, you definitely see the term, at least in the French context, being used for both. The way in which it's employed can differ. This is this is a, a vague question, but um, my question is sort of, if the Russian nihilistka had not existed, would it have been necessary to invent her? Mm -hmm. Like, was, um, uh, do you think that this particular image of sort of female terrorism slash political agency, where are its roots? And would, why, why was it so, I know you started to talk about this, but what was it that made it so powerfully resonant outside of Russia? And what were its precedents? Like, would, was there something about sort of this way of imagining um, female political agency that was either, you know, inevitable, not inevitable. Sorry, I know it's a very vague question, but I'm trying to get at why this was so powerful. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think several factors, I think if we want to go like sort of very deep roots, obviously it, it's about the West relationship to Russia and kind of the, the Orientalism, right, that exists there and the exoticization of things that come out of Russia, which obviously goes back way further than um, the mid 19th century. So I think that's a piece of it. I think there does seem to be something new about um, the female Russian nihilist, right? I mean, this, this style of terrorism is new at this point, right? And people debate about whether or not the Russians invented this kind of terrorism, et cetera. Um, so there was something legitimately shocking about it to people. Um, and then, so some of it, I guess, also has to do with just the, the actual facts of the thing, right? This was new, it was shocking. There were more women involved in these Russian movements than perhaps in equivalent movements elsewhere. Um, and then when you combine that with sort of the deep-seated ways of perceiving Russia, um, I like the way you put it though, would it have been necessary to invent her if she didn't exist? Um, and I wanna think more about it in those terms because um, I'm not sure at the moment, but it does seem to me that it's kind of a kind of, perfect storm of both kind of long-standing ways of thinking about Russia, um, you know, also the kind of long-standing tradition, which continued into the Cold War and continues today of viewing the analysis of literature as a way to understand something about Russia that you don't necessarily see with other contexts. So kind of these persistent factors um, with the actual novelty of what was going on um, you know, I think if you look to things like what I'm most familiar with as an equivalent would be sort of the increase in French anarchist terrorism in the 1890s. And you don't tend to see women committing violent acts. So there is something 
unique about that to Russia. Um, but yeah, it's so, yeah, that was not, that was a vague answer to your <laughs> big question, but I think that's, that's what I've got right now. I thank you for a really fascinating paper, Abby. Um, I my question is: um, so you've been focusing on the political and the um, the, the Russian kind of Orientalist uh, tropes, and I was wondering if you'd thought about the femme fatale, just the the notion of the femme fatale in French popular culture uh, as a non political figure, as a literary or artistic figure. Yeah, and there's obviously there's some really interesting work, some of it more in the 20th century about portrayals of women who commit crimes um, in the French press. So there's definitely a connection there. And I think I would need to do a little bit more comparative work first to see if there's something particularly, like if the femme fatale is of particular interest in France rather than in Britain or elsewhere in Europe. But yeah, I think there's probably definitely something to that if you look at the broader context of like Fée d'Hiver, for instance, um, if it involves a woman committing a crime, it's like extra salacious and like extra covered in the press. So there definitely also just is that connection to women who commit crimes um, as well. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's all it's all related. <laughs> so yeah, yeah thank Lizzie you Borden. That. Lizzie Borden gets more press than yeah. So. Yeah the general sort of idea that if a woman commits a crime, it's like extra aberrant, like committing any crime is aberrant, but if a woman commits it, it's super aberrant. Um, and we see that right with like, for example, Stepniak's attempts to argue that like, this isn't actually aberrant, Europeans just don't see it in the right context. Um, so that, yeah, that further complicates it because there is something obviously that I'm arguing unique to the portrayal of Russian women, but it certainly has a lot in common with just the portrayal of women in general, women who commit crimes and violence in the press. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did, did, have you looked at all at uh, Sonia Zolotaya Ruchka? Do you know her? Not, um, I am familiar, but I have not looked at it in any sort of depth. So I'd love to hear more about it. Well, I know, I just know most about her from Wikipedia, but that she was a, a pickpocket, I think and very famous and became kind of a subject of films. Um, oh, right, that is how, it, like, she's also subject of a lot of sort of popular right, right. fiction. Right, uh, right, popular cultural heroine. Um, so- Yeah, that might I, be a good point of comparison, actually. Thank you. And uh, she's also Jewish, which is maybe an interesting twist in there somewhere. Um, Yeah, um, that, yeah, um, and the question of, right, I sort of unequivocally was just speaking about Russian, right, and then the Russian colonies in Europe, but we know that a lot of those immigrants were Polish or Jewish or, you know, they were from the Russian Empire, but they weren't necessarily ethnically Russian, so that adds a whole other layer to consider at some point. Um, Another thing that, that comes to mind is I was just looking at, I think it might be in Dostoevsky's journal, uh, journal Vremia from 1861 or 62. Um, I think it's that journal where he uh, has a, a, what do you call it? A column, basically a kind of a constant, uh, constantly publishes details on trials that are taking place in Paris. And a lot of them have women. They're, you know, women accused of crimes. Maybe most of them are about women. Um, and I don't know if that's to, uh, to interest women readers. He seems to have been, he has a lot of, he publishes a lot of women in that journal mm -hmm. and seems to maybe try to attract their readership as well. Um, but there's something uh, obviously intriguing and salacious to him about that. Um, yeah, thank you for that uh, reference. I am a historian who sort of moonlights in reading literature, so I definitely <laughs> uh, need to go over some of the finer points of. Um, you know, let me. See, I'll see if I can find what I'm talking about and send you a link. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. That was really interesting.
I just listening to this conversation and reading the paper, it sounds to me like Russian revolutionaries had just lost the public, you know, the, the public information war or the, 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 the contest for reputation in, in the European imaginary. And it kind of seems unfortunate that Stepniak decided to double down on, on nihilism as a term that he was going to use to try to justify the, the, um, the, re the, the revolutionary's activities, because after all, nihilism does mean lack of moral, lack of moral, a, a re rejection of moral concepts and standards, right? And so it seems, it seems unfortunate that he, unlike Tihomirov, was and kind of ironic Tihomirov, who had turned against the revolutionary movement and was mm -hmm. writing against it, is the one who says that nihilism isn't appropriate. Stepniak, who's trying to justify it, says that nihilism is an okay term to use, but clearly anybody who uses the term kind of do does exactly what people, people are, are saying happens, namely that it denies, denies the revolutionaries or terrorists of any kind of moral, moral standing. So yeah, what would, would you want to say then that in light of your findings, it's the, the ter terrorism as a campaign for publicity and public sympathy has failed in 1906? So that's a really interesting question. And I think if I had talked more about the British case, um, it might seem a little bit different. Um, so in, and this is a little bit earlier than 1906, maybe 1880s, 1890s, but Obviously at this time, and I am by no means an expert on Irish history, but Britain is dealing with a lot of terrorism related to um, Irish people who are seeking independence. They're often referred to as Fenians in the press. And you see a lot of really interesting stuff in the British press, um, and I'm still developing my thoughts on this, specifically contrasting Russian nihilists with Irish Fenians um, and using that to, to put nihilists in a very positive light. So in a way, in, in that kind of venue, they sort of have one. You see these editorials and stuff saying like, well, you know, at least terrorism isn't great, but at least, you know, the nihilists have ideals. They're professional. They know what they're doing. They're really good at making dynamite. The Fenians, like, what do they even want? They, they're so bad at terrorism, like all this stuff. Um, as kind of like a funny anecdote, a lot of um, financial support for Irish revolutionaries came from Irish emigres to America. So there were like a lot of active sort of organizations supporting them in the US. And um, there was one guy who sort of took on a Russian persona. He named himself like Professor Mezeroff or something like that. And he was sort of like a dynamite expert in the US. And I read an interesting article, <laughs> can't remember the exact date on it from the Washington Post being like, you know, we don't need to worry about these Irish people. The people we should be worried about are people like Mezeroff. But, uh, you know, this historian of Ireland I read found out that Mezeroff was fake and not a Russian person and just sort of using this. So in some ways, they may not have won in terms of, you know, kind of converting people to the cause, but in terms of sort of being feared and being seen as professionals and being seen as sort of like the way to do political terrorism, um, in the British context, at least. Um, and there, you know, around 1905, there was a fair amount of sympathy for the Russian cause in France. The French government couldn't really do anything about it because France and Russia were in, um, you know, the dual alliance at that point. So they didn't want to do anything to anger the Russian government. But you see a lot of the kind of stuff you might expect from intellectuals and leftists sort of saying like, it's our duty as French people to support these revolutionaries, um, you know, what they're asking for is what we did in the 18th century, you know, and you, you may know that my sort of broader background interest, right, is on the connection between France and Russia. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really interesting because in some ways they are successful, but I think what you sort of, the kind of case you just laid out is also true. Um, so yeah, those are some of my unorganized thoughts on that. Yeah, um, this is really fascinating talk. So I keep having these sort of big vague questions and you might've addressed this a little bit already, but how does it happen again that the Nihilistka goes from kind of trying to be sexless or at least unsexy um, in the Russian context to being eroticized? 
outside of Russia? How does that transition happen? Did you, I think you already talked about it, but I missed it. Um, that's something I'm still, I think, trying to fully develop because I think you're right. There is something right um, sexless about the Nihiliska in, in the Russian context, whether you know it's women themselves saying, um, you know, this is the way I'm presenting myself. Um, although, I don't know, I, I think it probably comes from the fictional aspect, right? You want a, a heroine who is kind of the femme fatale and who kind of, one of the things that Gagnier clearly gets a lot of, um, you know, pleasure from as a writer is like drawing out these long contrasts between how Wanda dresses and looks when she's at court you know, mingling with people versus how she has to dress down and transform herself um, when she's hanging out with the nihilists and, you know, talking to women factory workers. So I wonder if a lot of that actually comes from the fictional component and then kind of finds its way into the, into the um, coverage. I, I bet you're completely right about that. And this is just yet another way in which sort of genres that we associate with fiction impinge on life. And uh, I, I think that's really, really fascinating. And if you read, say like upper count, upper class Russians accounts or you know their reactions to female nihilists, it's all about how disgusting they are. Oh my God, yeah. her fingernails are so dirty. She must yeah. be so bad. So it's just fascinating how this is, how, how, how this can flip. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in quite those terms, but you're right. Like the sort of, um, yeah, there's definitely something there. You you definitely see some, I feel like in, there's a funny moment and I think it's Vera Sulich's memoirs where she talks about some kind of weird interaction she had with Nechayev where it seems like he's kind of hitting on her and she's like, what is this? So you see some kind of interesting things about kind of um, relationships or that kind of thing between men and women, but you you really don't see a lot of, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's not really a question, but it's, uh, I, I really love, I would love to continue this topic on uh, how uh, Nihiliska uh, turned out to be uh, femme fatale in France. And I was thinking about uh, the distance, the geographical distance, because we know uh, that uh, Zenina Zhukovska, who was, she was actually one of the first women who called herself uh, Benihilist, but at the same time, she ended up her life being a wife of the biggest, one of the biggest bankers of the Russian empire. And I think that if we are thinking um, the, about the shift between the real woman who wore who lived their real life in Russia and for, for whom the nihilism was part of the la life path and creation of the myth, uh, it's, it's a question about yeah, my imaginary uh, appearance of how the, um, the ideal nihilist should look like instead of dealing with a real woman who weren't so dirty, who actually like looked very different from uh, how Nichaev did, and yeah, maybe the 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 answer on on the on uh, on the question about the shift should be in the um, should lie in this geographical disconnection between like real and imaginative. Yeah, I think that's why um, I kind of settled on the word archetype, but maybe like even more accurate to say kind of ideal type. Like I like the, how you put that. Um, yeah, the geographical disconnection is something to think more about because I think part of the reason why Europeans in this period are so fascinated with, you know, who they consider to be female nihilists is because there actually is some geographic proximity, right? Russian colonies in Switzerland, in Paris, in London. So you might actually encounter a Russian nihilist on the street, right? If you live in one of these big urban areas and um, as some of you may know, it becomes a huge political issue in Switzerland because they've just offered um, you know, political asylum to so many different uh, Russians and then also the women's students and all of that. So there is a geographical distance, but 
if you're going to encounter a Russian woman in a city, it's not totally unlikely that she would be someone with connections to or interest in, you know, kind of revolutionary movements. So yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. It's not a question I want to follow in this line of thought. Thank you very much, by the way, for your talk. Um, it's about women who fall in love with terrorists and become terrorists themselves. And this may be out of your out of your um, space and out of your time, but because you had Susanne Albrecht on your on one of your slides, I was thinking about Gudrun Enslin, who well, there is this idea that Gudrun Enslin became a terrorist because she fell for this horrible, but for her obviously sexually very attractive, charismatic uh, Andreas Bader, and mm -hmm. she was not the only one. So, so how do women, this, this is not, this is another, well, another development, but uh, eroticism is, plays a big role here. And I was also thinking of Ildiko Enyedin's um, movie. I don't know whether you know that it's a Hungarian filmmaker. It's called My 20th Century. And there it's about twins and they are separated. And the, the one twin becomes an anarchist and the other twin becomes a prostitute and they both fall for the same man and somehow meet there. So um, I think this erotic line is very, very important in, in yeah, well, it's very important. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> you're right. And one thing that reminded me of um, is there is a British newspaper article from like the London Times or something from 1907 that I didn't quote because it's very long, but I absolutely love it. It kind of touches on this. So you have this correspondent who's traveling around who is the, the you know, the Russian correspondent because these British newspapers had more money for that sort of thing. And he's traveling around and he's saying it's 1907. So, you know, Maria Spirodonova was kind of a year before, but he's only just heard of her. So he's kind of like asking people about her. And he has a sort of long satirical musing. He's like, you know, when I'm out in the provinces and I'm sitting at, you know, the house of the local gentry and I don't really have anything to talk about, I, I might ask their teenage daughter to see her album. And she always has an album and she'll bring out the album and go through it. And there's these poems and photo, you know, photos of different revolutionaries and stuff. Um, and it's just like a very funny take on that. And I think in addition to, right, you know, as in the German case, you have these real relationships between men and women. You also have this sort of like, I don't know, the way he describes it, it's almost like, um, you know, and this doesn't give teenage girls enough credit, but it's almost like she's got an album of sort of like, you know, boy band type celebrities that, she, and women as well, right? It's not just men. So there definitely is something to that. And in the coverage of these women that I talked about, especially Jean T and Tatiana Lyantseva, there is some speculation of like, oh, did they just read too much? And that's why they wanted to do this. So there's kind of this mixture of like that eroticism that you mentioned with sort of this other kind of level of celebrity or intrigue or something like that. So it's kind of unrelated, but. On that question of albums, which is not really my question, um, those were real. Mm -hmm. um, if you look through the history of postcards, for instance, and how they're used in the revolutionary movement, for instance, I can't remember if it's Martov's family or Dan's family, but one of them, a daughter leaves in her memoirs, a description of the album that their nanny had and their nanny interspersed family photographs with postcards of all the revolutionaries that she knew um, through the family. And so there was a really interesting blending going on there. And certainly revolutionaries absolutely collected like fans, mm -hmm. like Lenin did. Yeah. You know, and Malinovsky did and, and these kinds of people. But my question was to you, Abby, thank you for the talk. What's your end point for this? Because today you've kind of ended at 1906 and it's a really neat compartmentalization because if you go another decade, the eroticization becomes problematic. And what I mean by that is because arguably the most visible female revolutionary beginning by about 1910, certainly like in the American context, is Breshkovskaya, mm -hmm. who no one is going to ever say is sexy. <laughs> and, and Breshkovskaya through, you know, she's doing those speaking tours in the United States in 1904, 1905, but she really self homes her own image beginning about 1910, 1912. And then mm -hmm. she's gonna, that's gonna take off. And so suddenly the most visible female revolutionary in the Western world is an old woman who has deliberately in fact, in the past, scarred her own face to make herself look like a peasant. And so I think that I, I'm sort of wondering, like, how far are you going to go with this? 
Um, you know, what are you going to do about these other places that come out? Are you intending to go into the American context? So those are sort of my questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I'd love to think more about uh, Brashkovskaya is kind of almost a counterpoint. I think she could provide an interesting contrast, right? The whole grandmother of the Russian Revolution thing. Um, so in a way, go. You know, I, I kind of do intend this project to go at least at the end into the 20th century because I think the um, sort of 1970s connections are a little bit underexplored. I've done some work with a friend of mine who studies um, uh, political violence in Germany and Japan in the 1970s. And the Japanese case is also really interesting. I didn't mention this because you see a lot of the same tropes pop up to talk about Japanese women who commit political violence. So it's almost not just Europe, it moves outside. So that's the piece I kind of want to get to. Um, but I like the idea of someone like Brashkovskaya as giving a way to talk about this by providing like the most counterpoint of a counterpoint of the way she presents herself. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. So um, I'm not sure how much I would get into the American case because you have to draw the line somewhere. I tend to have like a very, whenever I'm working on a project, like the biggest of big picture brains, like I always want to bring in everything. Um, I got super interested in the Irish connections after um, a reviewer for an article I wrote mentioned it. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of touch on a little bit of everything while keeping Russia as the focus, obviously, and Europe as the focus. Um, so that may not answer your question totally, but um, you're right that we do see these interesting changes. Um, I will say the stuff in the, the chat about uh, Vera Figner, about dressing feminine, and you do see that. Um, I think it's Vera Zasulich who talks about like she got a new shawl and she had this new outfit that she put together before she went um, to shoot Trepov. So I didn't touch on it totally in my thing, but you know, these women do still kind of need to dress and act according to their class and social milieu. So there's an interesting tension there as well, right? Because um, they may not be particularly interested in it. We read other descriptions of Vera Zasulich that mentioned how terribly dressed she was and how weird looking she was and how people followed her around in the small town that she um, spent some time in um in earlier in the 1870s in internal exile so really interesting tension about like self-presentation and all of this stuff and how much of this is strategic according to the goals of the women and also kind of gets back towards the bigger question of how you know these women are presented as actors like all of this stuff is really calculated right um vera zasulich going to buy her new outfit um vera figner trying to blend in um you know, the thinking of the, the, and I know there are some scholars who've written about this already, but the very critical thinking about self-presentation and dress, I think, is maybe not unique to this milieu, but certainly very um, intense, maybe compared to um, other milieu at the time. Yeah, Lotman's theatricality. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I just want to say thank you. That was fantastically interesting, fantastically productive. You've left us with so much to think about. So thank you, Abby. Thank you also, Victoria. Um, really, really, really interesting material. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, I'll just say, I'm happy to talk further with anyone, Masha or whomever, wants to talk more about nihilists. Um, I'm actually at UChicago now. So my email address is just my oh, last name at uchicago.edu. So if anybody wants to talk further about nihilists, feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Will Thank do. you so much for having me. Bye. Thanks, everybody.